Hello. This lecture is going to be on the topic of ahimsa, the moral principle of nonviolence or non-harm that you find in certain Eastern religions. I'm here in front of the Taj Mahal in India um, to provide a little context for this presentation. Now, some of you might be thinking at this point, wait a minute, the Taj Mahal is not a Hindu religious uh, site. It was actually a Muslim mausoleum established in the 17th, created in the 17th century by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. And you'd be right. And so that is true. Um, but just trying to be a little inclusive. So uh, don't hold that against me. And just remember, we're not talking about Islam today. We're talking about certain Eastern religions. So the principle that we're talking about, as I mentioned, is uh, Ahimsa. And Ahimsa is a religion that, or excuse me, Ahimsa is a religious principle that derives from the religions of South Asia. It develops within India. And you can find Ahimsa developing within Hinduism, um, but also within Buddhism later, and in uh, Jainism as well. So what is this moral principle? Um, it's talked about usually as nonviolence or non-harm. Uh, however, this principle does go beyond what we would think about in terms of Western notions of nonviolence. So Western notions of nonviolence are usually limited to pacifism, um, but Ahimsa goes much further than pacifism. It's not just about not going to war or not killing another human being. Ahimsa uh, extends itself also to the animal kingdom. Uh, and so Ahimsa means that you're going to have to live a vegetarian lifestyle. You can't eat any sort of uh, meat or fish um, it doesn't mean that you have to be a vegan. You don't have to go that far, um, but vegetarianism is the norm uh, within Ahimsa as well. Um, in addition to that, then not surprisingly, you would not wear leather um, or fur or items like that, but it also means that you wouldn't have an occupation which causes uh, other human beings or animals harm. And so if you get a job working for McDonnell Douglas making parts for uh, fighter jets, that's a violation of Ahimsa. If you're working as a butcher or a fisherman, um, that's a violation of Ahimsa. And so and it does extend significantly beyond um, pacifism uh, in the West. It also means that you shouldn't engage in activities that cause other people harm, even recreational activities. So those of you playing rugby, you're in violation of Ahimsa. Sorry. So with that basic introduction, right, um, you get the idea that uh, the idea of ahimsa means nonviolence, non-harm, and you uh, extend this much beyond where you normally would in the West without with just not killing another human being. <clears throat> now, in the Eastern religions, um, the ones that we're talking about, there are some differences between them as in terms of how they understand what ahimsa involves and, and what it doesn't. Uh, so for the Hindus and the Buddhists in general, you are responsible for volitional acts, which may cause others harm or injury or death. So acts that you intend to do, that you willingly engage in. The Jains, on the other hand, the Jains take this to a different level. And if you're not familiar with the Jains, here's a picture of some uh, Jain women. Um, and Jains take the principle of Ahimsa a little further and say that, you also need to make sure that you don't accidentally harm other living beings. And so they'll often wear a veil over their mouths to make sure that they don't inhale um, any small insects. Um, they often will walk with a broom sweeping the, uh, the ground in front of them to make sure that they don't accidentally step on a bug or something like that. And so the Jains take Ahimsa even further. And I used to think about this as if the Jains were doing something qualitatively different. Right? The Buddhists and the Hindus were saying you're only responsible for volitional acts and the Jains were taking an additional qualitatively different step and saying that you're also you know, responsible for the things you don't intend to do. And while that is true and there is a distinction, I, I think that these positions are a little closer uh, than we might think and they have some relevance uh, for us as well. If you go stomping through life and um, not really intentionally harming others but not really taking into account the well-being of others, that's not the, the, the most morally virtuous approach to living, right? And so if you are harming others through your negligence, through just not caring or not trying, um, yeah, that, that, that's a moral issue. And I think Hindus and Buddhists are, are also going to say, yeah, you have responsibility to, to make an effort. Um, the Jains take that to 
a particularly remarkable degree, um, but I'm not sure they're doing something as qualitatively different as I originally thought. Okay, so uh, we understand basically what Ahimsa is, what it entails, some of the different religions that draw upon it. Um, and at this point, though, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, if this is the religion of Hindus and Buddhists and Jains, um, then why is it that India has a military? Why is it that Thailand, which is primarily Buddhist, has a police force and a military? Um, I mean, India, for goodness gracious, has nuclear weapons, right? Um, how can this, how can this be, right? How can, uh, these are supposed to be people who are living according to the principles of Ahimsa. How can you have professional soldiers? How can you have professional police forces and people who are in the business of violence? And also, not everyone in these countries is a vegetarian, right? You can go to restaurants and, and find uh, meat. So how does that really work? <clears throat> well, I spoke about this in another lecture, um, but let me try to capture the essence of the, this issue. Eastern religions are a little bit different than Western religions in this regard. So in Eastern religions, it's more that you prescribe the ideal. The ideal moral principle is ahimsa. Right? This is what you're trying to do. This is the ideal that you're trying to reach, or at least someday trying to reach. Um, you may not be working towards that right now, um, but that's the ideal. And so you want to move closer to this ideal. In this lifetime, maybe you do a little less violence and harm than you're inclined to. And then in the next lifetime, um, you can move closer to that ideal. Because remember, reincarnation is part of this mix. And so you're working to improve your virtue time uh, as time unfolds and lifetime to lifetime. And so right now you may not have that luxury. So I mentioned this in the other video, but if you're poor and your children are malnourished and someone gives you a chicken, you eat the chicken. Right? That's, no one is going to fault you for that. You don't have the luxury of being a vegetarian. And I think that uh, Western vegetarians have to remember that. Vegetarianism is a luxury, right? Uh, for my students, you can go into the cafeteria and pick from all these different vegetarian options because you live at a remarkable time where there's so much food available. But for many people around the world, vegetarianism isn't an option. Um, so again, you may not have the luxury of, of being a vegetarian in this lifetime, but you can try to be a good person, and maybe in the next lifetime you'll have more wealth, more resources, and maybe then you can be a vegetarian. Also, um, with regard to the caste system, if you were born into a princely caste, if you were born into the warrior noble caste, um, if you were born into a, a family of police officers, then it may be that in this lifetime, yeah, you can't reach the ideal you're going to have to engage in the business of violence. You can try to do that with integrity. You can try to do that um, with uh, a desire to harm others as little as possible, but you don't have the luxury of living according to the ideal. And some of you may remember the story of Prince Arjuna and Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, and that's the situation that he finds himself. So how is it that you can teach the principle of nonviolence and non-harm and still have countries and, and adherents where uh, people are engaged in violence? Uh, hopefully this helps explain a little bit of that. <clears throat> I've actually been told uh, or read that uh, even the Jains uh, had some folks within their community who were uh, formed military units to protect the rest of the community. So even the Jains apparently um, had some people in the business of violence for the sake of others. Okay, so uh, to sum up this difference between East and West, in the West, what we find generally is you've got rules, and if you don't follow the rule, that's a sin. Maybe sins can be forgiven, um, but if you're not following the rule, that's a sin. Um, but in the East, you have a different model where you want to grow in virtue and move uh, towards a higher idea. Okay, so why Ahimsa? Right? Why is there this principle in uh, certain Eastern religions um, of nonviolence and non-harm. Usually, um, when we talk about nonviolence and non-harm, whether it be uh, Western pacifism, or if we're talking about uh, Hinsa in the East, we focus on the, uh, the victims of the violence, right? We think about them, uh, and that's usually where the discussion takes place. So Ahimsa is good because you are not inflicting harm on others, whether they be human beings or whether they be animals, all of us ultimately um, of the same sort of uh, being on our, on our various uh, journeys. 
Um, and so the focus is, yeah, you don't want to cause harm. You don't want to cause suffering to other living beings because that sucks for them. Uh, and that's true, right? Um, and <laughs> you're certainly going to find that. Um, however, what I find interesting is that when you look at, uh, and I've looked primarily at Buddhist uh, texts uh, on, on the subject, when you look uh, at these Eastern religions, when they talk about these themes, um, they're not making utilitarian arguments for what will make the world a better place. So the Western pacifists, a lot of times, what they're saying is, well, yeah, we should uh, turn the other cheek, we should be pacifists, we should not go to war, because that makes the world a worse place. And they're saying that we cause ultimately more harm than good when we engage in violence. You may agree or may disagree, but you understand the argument. Um, but you don't find that argument typically being made uh, among adherents of these Eastern religions. Um, the focus isn't so much on what will ultimately make the world a better place. Um, there's some discussion about harming others and, and the, the bad that comes from that, but they're not making a utilitarian argument that if everyone lived this way, the world would be a much better place. Um, but rather, they're focusing a lot on the effect of violence on the one who commits the violence. And that's something that we don't talk an awful lot about um, in, in the West when we talk about pacifism. Um, but what is the effect on the person who engages in violence? Whether that violence is motivated by you know, compassion or care for the community, um, people who engage in violence, that has an effect on, on who they are. Uh, and so if you know police officers who've had to uh, be in the, the business of violence or soldiers or others, it can really affect um, the sort of person that, that you are and the sort of person that you become when you have to not only witness atrocities, but take part in atrocities. And they, even be, they may even be um, morally uh, blameless, um, but it does affect uh, the person committing the violence. And the Eastern religions focus a lot more on that. And so I wanted to share with you um, something that was shared with me uh, by a, a friend of mine who was a former Special Forces um, soldier. And he shared this with me, and I think it sheds some light on this topic. And so I want to read this for you. I remember my first kill. I used a knife. I wasn't sure I could do it at first, but I didn't want my teammates to think that I was a coward. The sentries needed to be dispatched before we could go on with the mission. Mark touched my shoulder. And I turned. You can do it, he said. I trusted Mark. He was my friend. So I did it. God, it had been so easy. I simply moved slowly, silently, up behind my target. The parkerized blade of my K-bar, razor sharp, poised for the strike. My hand went to his mouth at the same time the blood, excuse me, the blade slipped deep into the base of his skull. He was dead almost instantly. There was little struggle as his life slipped from him. I could feel the hot sticky blood flow over my hand and arm, soaking my fatigues. The smell of blood left an unusual coppery taste in my mouth. I knew this was something I would remember but how would I remember it? Was it good or bad? After that moment in time, I changed. I held little respect for life, especially my own. I didn't fear death then, and I fear it less now. What I did couldn't have been bad because I did it for my country, but it could not have been good because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. But kill I did, and kill I could do again and again under the authority of my country. But will I ever know the morality of it? Or is there only morality in death, whether committed, uh, excuse me, or is there any morality in death, whether committed in war or in the guise of religion? I believe the distinction matters little, but I am no priest or philosopher. I am a soldier and I do as I am told. So my friend who wrote this um, is a professional soldier. He's, uh, you know, by nature, uh, a soldier in a sense. Um, and for him, this first time that he had to kill another person profoundly affected him for the rest of his life. And so in the Eastern religions, there's a recognition that committing violence changes who we are. Um, it has an effect on us. This isn't how human beings are supposed to live. This isn't how we're hardwired to want to, uh, to carry on with one another. And so there's an effect. Um, for the one committing the violence that the Eastern religions uh, 
focus on. The last thing in, in regard to this is that in these religions, um, there's very often the notion that an enlightened being, uh, a bodhisattva, a Buddha, um, uh, someone who has attained to enlightenment or nirvana, cannot engage in this sort of violence. It's just a, a psychological impossibility that for those who are so enlightened, they just couldn't do this. It just isn't really something in their nature anymore that they could carry out. Um, and so that also enters into the picture. So in that sense, you see that ahimsa is both the effect of religious discipline and also a cause of um, religious maturity. And so it operates on both ends of, 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 of that spectrum. And uh, so you can see that the principle of ahimsa isn't just a moral guide, right? That here's a rule and you should follow this. It's, it, it, it penetrates much more deeply into the, the religious life um, and the, the cultivation of oneself and the care for one's community. What's interesting is that in a lot of these Eastern religions and countries and cultures where this, this principle is operative, there's often the pragmatic concern, yeah, but can we really live according to this? And so this, uh, there are exceptions to this that, that can appear from time to time, um, where people are trying to find moral justifications for violence, even for good Buddhists, good Hindus, and, and, and good Jains. Um, there are some, some wonderful books on this subject. If you're inclined, I can recommend one which is, uh, because this is a subject that I've been interested in, or if you would want to review the bibliography and see some other books, there's some that I can share with you as well. Um, but here's the takeaway that I hope you'll, you'll get from this, right? First of all, what Ahimsa is, uh, what actions it extends to, what religions it's associated with, um, but also that this isn't just a rule like vegetarianism or pacifism. Um, that this is much more of a, of a broad religious phenomenon that also relates to um, the effect not only on others, but on ourselves when we engage in violence. So thank you. And if you have any comments or questions or critiques, please feel free to leave them below. Uh, take care of yourself and be safe.